Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Pshad. And uh, FYI, I do work for the Smithsonian, but I'm in IT, so I don't really work <laughs> with any of the fun uh, exhibit stuff, but I will do my best um, to give you a better tour. So um, just a bit about myself. My name is Mohammed Al Khatib. Um, and I have, I've been a docent with the museum since uh, August of last year, so shortly after we opened in June. Uh, originally, I'm a Palestinian refugee from Lebanon, and I moved to the U.S. when I was 18 um, for, for school. And, um, and I'm an American citizen now, but uh, volunteering with the museum has really given me purpose as a Palestinian. A lot of Palestinians, when we moved to the United States, you know, we feel out of place and we feel disconnected, but the museum has really been uh, a way for me to uh, reconnect with uh, not only my identity as a Palestinian, but with the community, with the Palestinian community. And it's also given me the, the chance to share my story as well. So hopefully I'll be able to share a little bit more about that with the tour. So uh, before we begin the tour, as you can, uh, just to confirm, you probably can see my screen. Uh, we do have the tour on our website, so you're welcome to access it anytime. What I'm basically going to be giving you is an annotated tour, just to add my, my flavor to it, but I certainly invite you to uh, check it out for yourself. Steve did an incredible job uh, collecting all of the uh, pieces and uh, also um, we, you know, uh, adding all the artifacts to the tour as well. Uh, but just, uh, but before we begin, just a few caveats. We're not going to be able to cover everything. Um, uh, just, you know, in the interest of time as well. Um, uh, but I will try to go uh, be as thorough as possible. Um, and then after my portion is over, uh, then we're gonna uh, have Malak come on the line. She's actually uh, breaking her fast right now because she's in Turkey. So uh, she, uh, she's gonna be scarfing down her meal and then joining us at, uh, at 1.25, uh, so in about 15 to 20 minutes. And we're just gonna have a standard Q&A format uh, between her and myself, and then we will open up the floor for you all to, to participate and share your questions. Um, so with all that out of the way, uh, let's begin. So the first thing uh, when you enter the museum that you would see is we have uh, pieces of ceramic, and sorry for the, uh, for the shaking, we have pieces of ceramic and glass at the museum, uh, and these are great. Um, we have this Nabataean vase here, and it's uh, it was basically donated to us by the Javad Mahaney family. Um, and as you know, the, the Nabataeans uh, are, you know, they were an ancient people. They lived, uh, you know, they, and, they're, um, and they're considered one of the many precursors of the Palestinian people today. Uh, the, um, you know, from the Canaanites to the Israelites, and of course the Nabataeans as well. If you're familiar with Petra and Jordan, the Nabataean civilization was responsible for building it. That served as their capital. So uh, another thing, uh, another exhibit uh, item we have on the exhibit is this water jug. Uh, and this is actually made from Hebron glass. Uh, and as you know, Hebron is a city in, the, in, in Palestine, and it's one of the largest cities. And uh, beyond what you hear on the news about uh, Hebron, and it's frequently mentioned in the news because of the occupation, um, and of course, the settlement that sits smack bang in the middle of the city, Hebron is known for its glass making and its manufacturing actually in general. Um, but particularly when it comes to its glass, Hebron's glass is known throughout the Middle East for its quality and its endurance, and also its striking colors. Uh, this green, you know, uh, well, striking green here. Um, and uh, this piece in particular was actually donated to us and it was probably we can't accurately date when it was manufactured, but it was probably early 20th century. Um, the one thing I should mention too, uh, that is probably important, especially when, given these times, is that Hebron's um, uh, crafting and glass industries in general, uh, well, so Hebron's glass industry, as well as his other crafting industries like textiles and um, and ceramics, they're all under threat because of this, the Israeli occupation. Um, the, uh, the Israeli occupation really put a stranglehold on many of the industries, and which makes the purpose of this museum even more critical, right? Because we are here to preserve these stories in case that, you know, things could happen in the future. 
Uh, the next thing I wanted to go over were some of the maps we have in the museum. So we have a couple of maps. Um, this map here in particular is uh, really interesting. And I'm sorry, it's a little blurry to see here uh, because it is a very large map. But um, this is an old map. Uh, it was published in 1938 by the National Geographic. And as you can see, uh, the map is titled the Bible Lands. So obviously the, the cartographers had a specific audience in mind. And this was probably in response to the, um, the, the, the strong interest in uh, the Old Testament, right? In America, there was a resurgence of the Old Testament in the, in the late 18th, 19th, and then going up, you know, till today in the industry. And people really wanted to know more about the region. And this map was kind of an answer to that. Uh, it's probably really unclear, but the, the, the writings here in red actually uh, refer to events that took place in the Bible. So they took these events and they overlaid them over the cities and places. Some of the places are also in their biblical variants. But this is just an indication of the interest in Palestine, right? During, you know, in the early, in the early 30s. Um, and the, the obvious thing, uh, you know, that many Palestinians like about this map is that it actually says Palestine. And it's not because, you know, they were trying to, you know, uh, promulgate or suggest that you know, there, it was not a political thing. It's actually, you know, the, the, the country, the country was actually called Palestine. So uh, to give you some context, uh, for those who don't know, uh, the region at, you know, in the thirties at the time was under uh, the, uh, under colonial control, colonial rule, and Palestine was under the British mandate. So it was called the British mandate Palestine. Um, and this would stay like that until uh, the Nakba. Uh, and now, for those of you who don't know what the Nakba is, uh, the Nakba is, the, uh, is, is in Arabic, literally translates to catastrophe. It is the word that we Palestinians use to, to connote the, uh, the expulsion of over uh, 700,000 Palestinians from their homes and the deep population of over 400 villages, and essentially the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. Um, so up until the Nakba, up until that point, the country was called Palestine. So that's why this map is significant because it's an artifact about that. So if you ever come to the museum, highly encourage you to check it out. Um, it's a really fascinating map and there's a lot of really interesting things to talk about on it. Um, the other map we have actually was produced in house. Thank you again, Steve. Is there anything you don't do? <laughs> this map is actually a map of the Palestinian diaspora. It was produced in house between, and it was a collaboration between Steve and Amber Hurley, who is also another volunteer with the museum. They spent tireless hours looking for uh, finding statistics about where Palestinians live throughout the world. Um, and then we collected it all here in a map. Um, and you're actually, we have an interactive display uh, that you're welcome to see. And it's if you go to the uh, virtual tour, we have a tab here that you can see, um, and it's actually a, an interactive tour of the map. Um, basically, um, well, I'm not gonna do that because it's gonna take forever to load. But the map itself shows, you know, so it paints an interesting picture. Obviously, uh, most Palestinians uh, today um, live in the Middle East, in the Palestinian diaspora do live you know, in the MENA region. But uh, also uh, you can notice here in South America, there's a very large Palestinian population. Chile has the largest population of Palestinians, uh, the largest Palestinian community outside of the Middle East. And most of the, uh, uh, the original immigrants to Chile were not, you know, they were probably Im uh, economic migrants who were going to, uh, they wanted to, you know, they wanted to expand. And so a lot of uh, people from the Levant in general like Syria, Lebanon, uh, and Palestine included, uh, went over to South America. And, and Chile, you know, today has a large, very large Palestinian population. Um, and they are, a lot of them are still very actively engaged in the uh, Palestinian Aldi or the Palestinian cause. So it's great. Um, so I highly encourage you to check out the, the virtual uh, uh, or the digital map that we, you know, that we have here on the Palestinian diaspora. All right, uh, moving on. So uh, going back to National Geographic, uh, they seem to have a lot of interesting stuff about Palestine. We actually do have an article here on, um, uh, well, this was actually an edition of the of, uh, National, National Geographic edition that was published in 1914. The head article was village life in the Holy Land. And obviously this article tried to capture uh, 
for, again, its specific target audience, uh, the what life was like in rural villages in Palestine. Um, just to give you my personal insight, I mean, I found the article a little problematic. They really, really focused on the tribal, rural aspects of Palestine, and they didn't really take into account, you know, that Palestine was a burgeoning, um, uh, it was a sophisticated society and, uh, you know, cities were pretty interconnected and they were large cities. They were, they were, they were they had large urban areas. And we do actually have a few images here that kind of contrast this. Here we have a, uh, a, pic a photograph of a wedding ceremony in Palestine. Uh, as you can see, the man is wearing a suit, you know, Western suit. And, um, you know, they are, um, and this was actually taken uh, from the Library uh, of Congress. And they have a, the Palestine Photo Project. And um, so we, we wanted to show the different perspectives of how Palestinians were viewed, the lens, the, the, the lens by which Palestinians were viewed, particularly from, you know, from American eyes. Um, and uh, in general, uh, as Palestinians, we do feel that our, our identity is dictated by how others perceive us, you know, more so than many other identities. We are constantly barraged by, um, by people trying to either uh, dis uh, discount our very existence, you know, for their own gain, political gain, or, um, or, or who question our authenticity as a people and as a culture, um, and uh, which makes why this next exhibit, I want you so critical and important for, especially for me as a Palestinian refugee. Um, so over here, we have a collection of identity cards and passports, particularly from, uh, and, birth, and certificates, sorry, from uh, around British Mandate Palestine and, short, and, and up until after the Nakba. Um, and this is my favorite part of the museum because it speaks volumes. Um, Particularly from you know such mundane pieces like normally you wouldn't see like pieces of paper like this featured so prominently at a museum. Certainly at the at the Smithsonian we don't have something like this, but um, over here we have uh, passports that were issued in British Mandate Palestine. Just an interesting fact, you know, both Arab Palestinians and Jewish Palestinians, because there were you know, Jewish immigrants and and Jews who had lived there were both referred to as Palestinian. They likely shared the same documents, you know, it's just the internals were probably different. Uh, but this here, you can see actually, this is for the first time, uh, you know, that we have this on display, we can actually see inside the passports themselves. And these were actually donated to us by the Sa family. Um, and uh, we are really grateful for them. All of these documents are from them. So it kind of tells the story of their family. Um, so these are, you know, this is passport covers over here, we don't have a um, uh, a tool a tool tip for this, but these are also documents like uh, uh, paper documents that people usually carried around with them all the time, again from British Mandate Palestine. Over here we have a marriage certificate, and this is actually a very interesting uh, piece of paper. Uh, this uh, this this is uh, this this marriage, um, as you can see, uh, was from uh, between uh, God. I can't even read. Uh, Okay, sorry about that. Um, so this, this the, the certificate itself was issued in 1964, but the marriage itself took place in 1934. And that stuck out to me. Um, why did it take 30 years for the certificate to be produced? Um, and the reason for this is because this couple was married, uh, this is between um, Su'ad Su Su and Hannah, they were, um, uh, or John, in Arabic, and they were married in 1934. Obviously, this was under British Mandate Palestine. However, uh, when Israel was created, um, this family's life was turned upside down. And so they had to get all of their documentation reissued again. And this time they had to go to the Jordanian government. And so they had to get um, a new marriage certificate. And this kind of speaks to the Palestinian experience in general. The Nakba really uh, transformed, radically transformed our lives as Palestinians in such a short amount of time, um, especially being refugees, having to start our lives all over again in foreign countries, under foreign governments, um, in unfamiliar places. Um, and this certificate 
it's so mundane, but it really brings that point home for me. Um, and we do have more, uh, we actually do have a display that goes into more detail about the Nakba and the, you know, the, 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 the events leading up to it, you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't just a sudden thing, you know, there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of buildup that, that uh, you know, that happened over time to, that led to, to how things were. You know. Uh, one panel, you know, uh, this this image here shows Arab protesters, um, uh, Arab Palestinians protesting uh, the British authorities in Jerusalem, and this is at the Afa Gate. They were protesting the increasing rise of Jewish immigration into Palestine at the time. Uh, though while this this was taken in 1933, so before the events of World War II, obviously uh, there was a lot of Jewish immigration or uh, into Palestine at the time precipitated by, uh, you know, Zionist leaders seeking to capitalize on this promise of a Jewish home in Palestine. And many Palestinians were very apprehensive and nervous. Yes, 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 yes. Ooh, there's feedback. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, you know, and many, uh, many Palestinians view the, view the, the British with contempt uh, and uh, distrust over this. Uh, obviously, their fears did come to realize it to to fruition because. Thank. You. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. So, um, you know, uh, because you know, uh, by the time 1948 rolled around, the uh, well, uh, just to backtrack if I have for a year, uh, you know, in 1947, uh, the British pulled out. You know, they were weakened by. Uh, the events of World War II, and they just could not sustain their uh, their colonial uh, governments. They turned to the United Nations uh, for a, a partition, yeah, for a plan. And the, and the United Nations, which had newly formed at the time, came back with a partition plan to divide Palestine into two states: an Arab state and a Jewish state. Uh, of course, the the uh, the, the 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 Arab uh, the Arab Palestinians rejected this plan, and this was seen as a declaration of war by the Jewish, the JNC, the Jewish National Congress, and war ensued. And this war resulted in uh, what we know as the Nakba today, uh, and the declaration of the State of Israel. Over here, we have a few images. Kind of, I mean, these are difficult for me uh, because I know that my family went through this. Uh, uh, these are uh, Palestinians walking; they're marching away. Uh, from their homes, um, and uh, in, in in my case, my family we are originally from Akka, which is in the north of Palestine, um, and they were forced out of their homes, and they had to walk by foot into Lebanon. Uh, my family settled in uh, initially in Damur, which is a refugee camp outside of Beirut, and um, following the Damur massacre. Uh, of the 1970s, they moved to uh, to Ain Hilwi. Um, so I can just, you know, my, my, you know, many of the refugee camps that were formed, they kind of looked like this image here. This is the Jaramana refugee camp in Damascus in Syria. Uh, now Jaramana looks very different. It is a concrete jungle, <laughs> but just like many of the refugee camps that we see today, they have been around for so long that they are no longer, uh, I mean, they're only camps in my name. They are, uh, um, you know, they are for the most part, the lives, the, the, the only thing that Palestinians know today, many Palestinians who live there know, that's the only thing they know is being a refugee. So, okay, so this is the first part of the museum, which kind of covers the history of Palestine. Um, I'm just going to go into gallery two now. And this part of the museum uh, focuses more on, um, you know, some of the symbology uh, around the Palestinian solidarity movement. We also go into, um, you know, how contemporary life today is impacted by the events of the occupation. Um, and we also talk about some of the icons that represent uh, the Palestinian movement. So here we have a wall of some of these uh, issues. So, um, so I'm just going to go over them real quick in the interest of time. Over here we have a, uh, this is a poster uh, from International Women's Day. And uh, this was actually produced in 1982. Um, and it's, um, um, 
it was basically you know it was it was uh, it was published around you know to commemorate uh, international women's solidarity day international women's day and um you know palestinian feminist movement kind of burgeoned after the uh you know uh, after the uh, the nakba much like much like civic life palestinian civic and so uh, civic and political civic life really uh, came into fruition you know we had this huge catastrophe that happened to us as people and we wanted to fight it in any way and this fight took on many many forms you know from uh from from uh, feminist uh, movements to student organizations here is oh not this i misclicked this poster here uh ooh. Okay, well, this is, we have a poster here from a, a student group, as you know, uh, student movements, particularly here in, uh, in the West, have really uh, formed the backbone of the Palestinian Solidarity Movement. We have the Boycott, Divestment, Sanction, BTS campaign, which started their lives in, on, on, on many American campuses. So student groups were really important. This was, this particular uh, poster here was uh, published in 1970. And the ironic thing is that, you know, it says the struggle for uh, is still young. <laughs> um, it's not, it's not so young today, but, you know. Uh, another uh, thing that I wanted to point out is some of the symbology that we have, and this here is an image of Handala. Normally, when I give tours, I ask people, "Have you heard of Handala?" Or, or you know, a lot of people are familiar with the with with this uh, with the cartoon or with this graphic, but they uh, don't really know the significance of it. Um, so Handala, uh, which has become actually the uh, symbol for the BGS movement, is a uh, it, 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 it was for it, it was coined first by um, Najil Ali. Najil Ali was a famous uh, political cartoonist. Um, he grew up as a, he was also a refugee um, like me. Um, and he, uh, um, uh, he would normally draw Handala um, on his cartoon. So he was a political cartoonist and he was also very controversial. Um, he made a lot of enemies, both, you know, particularly by, you know, Israel really disliked him and also the Arab government. He was very critical of the Arab government. Um, and Handala was basically his nom de guerre. He would paint, uh, he would draw Handala um, in almost all of his cartoons. And the, and it's, it, there are a lot of things to take note here. So, you know, Handala is a child, it, basically a 10-year-old Palestinian child who never grows up. He's in tattered clothes. Um, and this kind of, this signifies uh, the, the sense of abandonment that Palestinians feel, you know, that the world has left us. Uh, Handala's uh, hair, and this is something I learned recently, is spiked, which kind of, uh, you know, that I've learned is, uh, signifies, you know, the, the desire to be left alone, you know, the, uh, how porcupines, when they're feeling under threat, their spines go up, so uh, so Najin and I deliberately drew that to kind of signify that. And to me, most importantly, Handala is looking, his back is turned away from the viewer. So when you look at the cartoon, you see this child looking, staring into the scene, his back, you know, and again, this reinforces the sense of abandonment, the sense that the world has left us to perish. Uh, Najil Ali was assassinated in 1987. And we don't know exactly who did it, but you know, um, chances are it was actually a collaboration between the Israeli Mossad or the intelligence services and um, I think the Kuwaitis. Um, he's left an indelible mark on the Palestinian movement, much like many others like him, like Mahmoud Darwish and Bassan Kanafani. Um, uh, we, we, and we, we actually do at the museum have a making their mark wall. Um, I don't know if I can show it to you here, um, but we do have a making, and we do have his biography. But I highly encourage you to to look him up and check out his work. Um, um, we also have a uh, a wall here of Palestinians holding keys. The key is a very important symbol to the Palestinian resistance movement. Many Palestinian families, when they left their homes in 1948 and 19, you know. Uh, they took their keys with them, thinking that, you know, or hoping that they would go back. And of course, that did not happen. So the key remains uh, as a symbol, a lingering symbol for the desire to return to our ancestral place. Um, my grandfather had his key, um, and it looked very similar to this key here. 
and he would always, you know, harp, he would always bring it out <laughs> to, to, for us kids as a reminder, you know, that don't, don't abandon your cause, don't forget. So the key serves as a critical reminder uh, of that. And many Palestinian artists use the key they, they, uh, in, in their work to, to, to signify this. Um, if you do come to our art gallery, uh, you will see this as well. Um, so over here, uh, we actually do have a series of videos um, that kind of go over the, the topic of resilience. I'm not gonna play them for you here. That would take a long time but I highly encourage you when you are doing the virtual tour to check them out. One of the videos uh, is, uh, uh, is it actually talks about uh, Shada's family's farm. So Shada's family, they have a farm outside of Bethlehem. And I hope I'm doing you justice to Shada, so please correct me if I say anything wrong. Uh, but it, it, it's called the Tent of Nations and they have been, become a symbol uh, uh, of resilience against Israeli occupation. Uh, the farm uh, actually serves as a, a place for um, uh, for workshopping um, nonviolent or uh, nonviolent resistance. So a lot of people from all over the world go to the farm and they take you know to learn more about how to 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 engage in nonviolent resistance. The story of the farm is fascinating because Israel, for years, <laughs> probably decades, has tried to wrench it away from their family, uh, even going through drastic measures uh, to cut off water uh, and electricity, um, essentially rendering the farm off the grid. But the farm has persevered. So they have answered. They have had an answer to all of these uh, uh, these restrictions, and so it's a really fascinating story. And another video we have on there is of the video of, uh, of uh, the village of Al Arakib. This is actually a Bedouin village, and it has been demolished over a hundred times by the Israeli occupation. Citing by the Israeli forces. Actually, this is a village that is in Israel proper today. Um, and the reason for this is, you know, uh, uh, they cite building permits and, and lack thereof. But every single time uh, the village was demolished, the residents would come back and they would rebuild it. So that is, if that is not an example of resilience, then I don't know what is. Um, we also do have a few images, photos here. These were generally, uh, generously donated to us by Anera. So for those of you who are not familiar, Anera is the uh, American Near East Refugee Association. Um, they are a group here in the United States that uh, are a nonprofit that works with Palestinian and Syrian refugees in the Levant. Um, so they go into the camps and they offer workshops and students. They, they, they kind of supplement UNRWA, which is the United Nations Relief Work Agency, um, so they do a lot of similar work with them. So these are a couple of images that they, a few images they donated to us. This is of Ahmed. He is a refugee from the Bedouin refugee camp in Lebanon, and he's studying. And we have another image below that of, um, uh, from the Nahr al bared refugee camp as well. This is also another refugee camp in Lebanon. Um, so it's nice to see kids smiling. <laughs> so. Um, and on a lighter note, uh, we have a, uh, a needlework exhibit. So we actually, um, uh, so needlework or tatris, uh, as we refer to it, is a uh, very, uh, very old Palestinian uh, craft uh, art form. And we, uh, we were actually donated, uh, um, we were actually donated these six panels, each one showing a different style of needlework pattern. Um, from Palestine. So each region had its own uh, distinct um, uh, stitching style or, or uh, a, you know, pattern style. Kind of, you know, it was a way of informing people when they would go into communal spaces like bazaars and markets of where they were from. Um, and uh, so, you know, these were donated to us. Uh, I'm using and this was actually, audio. And this was actually, uh, these are sticks of a collection of over 400 One panels. Thing, wait, am I on? Yeah, Hi. you are. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I did confirm. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and it, from, from all over Palestine, this example here is from Ramallah. Um, and this, you know, so people wearing uh, this the stick pattern, um, you know, they were immediately identified as being from Ramallah. Uh, the story of, and this is also new to me, actually, um, you know, uh, the story of how uh, 
of how Tatris works essentially is, is fascinating. Um, a lot of the patterns kind of signify things that are important to that specific village or region. Um, you know, um, for example, uh, Tatris patterns from the north, you know, had a lot of uh, uh, patterns of citrus, figs, you know. Uh, this particular pattern here shows uh, pieces of amah or wheat, um, um, you know. And uh, so, you know, so they're, they're, each, each distinct style had a story to tell. Um, so. And then we finally have an example here of a, a Tatris, a piece of a, a full thobe using the Tatris patterns. So. Um, the final thing I wanted to talk about is modern day Palestine today um, and, 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 and how things and how life under the occupation uh, is. And the big, one of the big um, big issues that Palestinians encounter today is movement, freedom of movement. This is a very big problem for us. Um, and so we wanted to highlight that. Um, we have a couple of images here of uh, Palestinians having to endure, uh, you know, going through one of the dozens of checkpoints put around the entire West Bank designed to restrict movement to Palestinians. Of course, with Gaza, it's Oh, off the charts, uh, terrible. But um, this here is an example of a uh, of of, um, uh, of one of the um, uh, checkpoints. You can see, you know, people are so crammed that they have to climb the uh, the rails to give space. Um, many Palestinians who have to work in to, uh, in Israel, uh, they have to wait for hours. Often, you know, starting at three a.m you know, to, uh, to wait their, their line. And of course, passage is not guaranteed all the time. So I've actually, I, I, as, although I'm a Palestinian, I've actually never been to the West Bank. Um, and so um, I've never had to endure this, this, you know, but uh, I would like, I mean, Shara, if you wanted to add anything, maybe, you know, uh, if you wanted to talk about your experience um, crossing uh, checkpoints. Yeah. So, so hi. Yeah. So I, yeah, actually, um, for the interest of time, if you can, we can just move on because it's one forty-five. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. No, and I can no, share okay. at the end with the questions and answers. If people okay. are asking specifically about, uh, uh so, so uh, can, can, can we just, uh, move on to, to yeah, yeah. Ask, uh, yeah, no more? worries. No worries. Well, this actually, you know, brings us to the conclusion of the uh, of of the permanent part of the exhibit, and I want to now. Uh, I'm super excited to uh, to introduce Malek Matar. Um, um, Malek is a I don't know if is Malek with us right now or yes. Oh, hi, Malek. There we go. I see hi. you. Yeah, um, um, Shada already uh, introduced her, but she's an artist originally from Gaza. She's currently in Turkey. And uh, we have a couple of a uh, couple of her pieces here at the museum. I'm super excited and honored to, to talk with her. We had a quick conversation yesterday, and I am very uh, very honored to, to to have you. So welcome, so welcome, Malak. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so um, much for having me and for the nice tour in the museum. Okay. Yeah, I hope I didn't bore you too much. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so uh, Malak, uh, I just wanted to ask you, you know, uh, I have a few questions here, if you don't mind. Um, the first question is, um, you know, when I first talked to you, I immediately wanted to know what was life growing up in Gaza like, and what do you miss most about home? Well, I had a very interesting childhood. Um, being a Palestinian in Gaza Strip was um, a very warm atmosphere because we are very connected. Like I lived um, with all my uncles in one building and that was sort of um, like, it, it was a, like a good life for me. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, at the age of eight, I have experienced the first war that left me with um, a trauma. Then a few years later, I had another war that was even longer. Then two years later, I had uh, the most brutal war, I would say, uh, and it was the time where I started painting. It was during the attack on Gaza Strip. Um, 
So Gaza for me is a very beautiful place, but it's ve it's very sad. I view Gaza as uh, the colorful uh, port, as uh, my studio that was filled with artwork. Um, I view it as my family, uh, but it, it's unfortunately uh, very sad what um, the situation has become after the three destructive mm -hmm. uh, wars in it. Um, Unfortunately, I left Gaza in 2017 and I was not able to go back because of the huge risk of not being able to go out again uh, because it was a very complex um, way when I tried to go out. It was from my family and also from society and also the border. Um, I miss many things about Gaza. I miss, uh, as I said, being with the family. I miss my relatives, uh, the beautiful places in Gaza Strip. So it's, of course, home and like, of course, I, I love my home more than any place I go to. Yeah, me too. I, um, you know, most of my family is in Lebanon and it's, uh, um, I, I mean, uh, up until a few years ago, I had not visited, you know, but now I make it every, I make it a point to every year to visit my family and, yeah. and just reconnect, you know, it's very critical for us passing. But I have that luxury, you know, I'm an American citizen now. I yeah. don't have, you know, it's just people underestimate the power, you know, uh, of, <laughs> you know, of, of citizenship and what that means, you know, to, to your livelihood and your freedom of movement. Um, your art is beautiful and I've actually had a chance to view your Instagram account. Um, what kind of art forms do you work with? Uh, do you just do painting or do you do more? And w w what artists inspire you? Well, I do mostly painting um, and I do some illustrations, but I mm -hmm. don't really share them uh, in my social media. Um, okay. I would say the form of my paintings are expressionist and sometimes symbolic, uh, but every, a lot of artwork inspire me. I wouldn't say that this artist or that because any painting that I can connect with or feel, it's a painting that inspires me in a way or another. So. Mm -hmm. I, I love all artwork that I can really connect with. Um, my so far favorite artist since I was a really a child it was Picasso. And maybe mm -hmm. you can see a little bit of Picasso <laughs> in my artwork. Yeah. And also Freda Coelho, the Mexican artist. I could mm -hmm. really feel the connection between her life and my life. Mm -hmm. um, like kind of the same struggle that we both have gone through. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's what inspires me. Gotcha. But we do have a couple of pieces. I can definitely see the influence here. This one is called Three Women. Um, and we do have another one as well. Um, this is uh, Women with Bird. Can you, can you talk about any of these or talk about Three Women? What inspired you to, to paint this? And you know, what, yeah. could vis what should visitors take from when they, when they see this, this, uh, this painting? Yeah, so my artwork is more about the story that I have and the story that other Palestinians have. And I try my best to show not only the pain, but the beauty of the life of a Palestinian. And mm -hmm. when I left in Gaza, from Gaza Strip in 2017, I left on my own and that was pretty difficult um, in a foreign country, not knowing the language, not knowing anything. So I had the first Ramadan that, which is a very big, uh, occasion for us as Palestinians. So I painted this to kind of depict the nostalgia or feel the feeling of homesick, like seeing all your family together and I am alone not being able to go there and celebrate uh, Ramadan with. So this painting is three women. Each woman has a different story. It's either uh, a girl or a woman or a mother. And as you see, it's like, it's a casual meeting, they're drinking tea. And as you see the piece on the plate, it means that some women, they are embracing hope, they are, some women are hopeful. As the one in, um, on the right, she's embracing that dove and some women are putting it on, on the table, which means mm -hmm. that they don't have hope or they lost hope. Um, so um, as you see the tea, it's the Turkish tea that you can't be in Turkey and not be addicted to tea. So as you see, like, <laughs> there are some inspiration from different, uh, different areas, which is in Palestine, but still the life 
in Turkey has influenced my artwork in terms of patterns and feelings. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. That's beautiful. Um, and would you like to talk about Women with Bird? This one is my favorite. It's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, this painting uh, has another title. It's called Jerusalem. And okay. in my first stay in Turkey, I stayed with two sisters from Jerusalem. And it was pretty inspiring when they told me about um, the real life in Jerusalem and the struggles they face as two girls, the occupation, the chic points when they travel, and, you know, the general life. And mm -hmm. for me, as a Palestinian, I was super lucky to be able to visit Jerusalem uh, in 2016 for exhibition in Jerusalem. And that was arranged by the American consulate in, um, in Palestine. Otherwise, I wouldn't have made it. Um, so seeing this, it, it was pretty emotional, like walking on um, a city that you, you've always learned about and you've always been uh, calling as a capital of Palestine. So this painting is an inspiration of the stories that I was told by my flatmates and also my experience walking in the streets of Jerusalem and other cities in Palestine. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of more questions. Um, what challenges have you encountered as a Palestinian artist and, uh, you know, as a refugee? <laughs> maybe these are two very disparate things, but I, I just felt, you know, that, and, and what advice do you have for other Palestinians looking to get into artwork or getting to, looking to get into art? Um, so I would first like to talk about um, the struggles I had as a Palestinian, as refugee, as woman. Um, as a woman, yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of things, but I'll try to make it short. No, no so worries. In, in Gaza Strip, um, I had a few struggles since I was young because of the experience that I had. Life was super political. Um, it was never safe being sitting and knowing that you might not be able to make it next year because, you know, like the bombings are so random and mm -hmm. they can uh, happen anytime without alarms. Uh, and I had a tough experience having seen my neighbor was killed on like I saw this scene that was like struck striking in in, in my life um, so it, it was a big of a struggle um, living in Gaza Strip as a, as a siege to place um, uh, as well like the electricity I was an artist I needed like more than anything and as a student as well but I was not like the average hours of electricity was um, four hours. Mm -hmm. So that was like, you need to reschedule all your plans according to those like, like few hours of electricity. Uh, the water, unfortunately, like in Gaza Strip, it's known that 97% of the water is undrinkable. Mm -hmm. And as a woman, I had a struggle um, because of the tradition customs that not only Gaza, but the Middle East have, like, there is oh, yeah. not much equality between women, men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is no much liberation. Like, if I need to go in Gaza and um, speak loudly about a political cause, I would not be allowed to. I wouldn't be allowed to mm -hmm. um, travel because I had a big struggle. I can later share the story of how I made it outside Gaza. So mm -hmm. uh, this was the struggle I had in Gaza Strip. Uh, and not being able to travel to my exhibitions. I had many exhibitions when I was in Gaza, but none of them I was able to mm. be present with. Um, outside Gaza, I was actually um, pretty shocked when I came to Turkey. It was a very difficult life. I thought that my poor English would help me contacting people, but I haven't used it so far. <laughs> so I had to learn. <laughs> so I had to learn. Uh, Turkish within six months to be able to survive. Wow. Um, I had struggled fitting in, you know, no, like living with a family your entire life, not having much responsibility. Then you come to Turkey, you are alone, nobody cares, mm -hmm. and it's you that have to encounter everything. Um, in the first year of Turkey, I was denied visa to enter Europe a couple of times, uh, to Britain and to uh, France, it was three times that I was rejected. So I felt like Turkey is another prison. 
Mm. Um, so if you wonder the kind of passport that I have, it's Palestinian authority, mm -hmm. uh, which is like, wherever I go, it's not, they don't see it as a country, but as an organization, which is like authority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I had a, a struggle being a refugee in Gaza and outside Gaza. It's, it, it, you know, being refugee and having a place to go to, for instance, if I was a Syrian refugee, I will know that at the end, there I can ha go to Syria. But mm -hmm. for me, I'm refugee in a village called Al Jora, which is away from Gaza. But now it's not Al Jora anymore. It's now completely uh, occupied. And as you said about the key, my grandparents, they both have the key for the house because they were hopeful that they will go just a few weeks after they left and they were expelled from their villages. Mm -hmm. So there is a struggle for Palestinians everywhere in Palestine or outside Palestine, but we still have hope. We still uh, carry the Palestinian cause on our shoulder for the world to know the truth mm -hmm. and the justice, of course. Yeah, thank you. Um, how can people f follow your work? You know, I want people to know more about your, your work and um, just to, 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 yeah. to see what you, you know, so I'm a very know. social media person, so okay. if you don't have Facebook, Instagram, you will have little chance to know my, <laughs> my story. Besides um, coming to the Museum of the Palestinian People. Yes, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I post everything on Facebook and Instagram. This is how I connect with people. This is how I was able to exhibit my artwork in many places all over the world. And this is how I was able to also market my artwork and be able to survive here in Turkey. So social media has been really great and I'm very, I'm, I'm very grateful for having social media. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Malak. Um, it was such an honor talking to you and I thank really look so forward to, to, to having you more uh, on these calls. So uh, this is not the Nihai, you know, this is not the end. Um, of course. So we're gonna, um, we're now going to open up the, the chat to questions. And I know we're running out of time, um, but I think we do have a few minutes to take. We have, the the, yeah. So we we actually have the call until two fifteen today, not until okay. two. Okay. Uh, but uh, people are welcome to to stay on. So uh, we would like to open it for questions and answers, and we can, if you would like to post your question on the chat or. If you would like to go ahead and ask uh, Malak uh, or, or the museum team uh, a question in particular, I will unmute everyone right now and uh, we can, we can uh, start. Am I on? Yes. I just, I just had a question for uh, Bashar Nasser. Is he a part of the Nasser family at the Tent of Nations? Does he know Dowd? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Hi. Hi, David. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, I, that's my uncle. Your uncle. Okay. Yeah. I, I was there in 2016 for the 100th anniversary. Oh, that's wonderful. We, I, uh, think, we, I think we might have met. I, I, I was there as well. I hope so. Yeah, it was a wonderful time. And I tried to keep Thank track you. of them. I, I'm wonderful. part of the... The Friends of uh, the Tent of Nations of North America and uh, try to keep in touch with what's going on and uh, be supportive. Wonderful, wonderful. That's great to, to hear, yeah. They're, they're making a wonderful witness. I, I see them as a light set on a hill that uh, speaks of what peace is really about and Thank brotherhood. You. Thank you, David. Yeah. Thank you for your words. <laughs> Could, could you have a little bit more in the museum on the Tent of Nations as an example of what uh, kind of things are being done in a very positive way? We actually have a video. Uh, I'm not sure if you, if you followed what Mo was saying. We have a video on, uh, in the museum uh, and you can, go, you can go see it uh, on your own after this tour to th that shows the, the farm and the story of the family and their struggle 
in the face of uh, the occupation and, and being taken away from the from the from the farm. Okay, that's yeah. good. It's so that's that's there, and uh, of course, you know, everyone is welcome to visit Palestine, visit uh, my family farm, and uh, if you would like to go, just uh, contact me. I have put my information on the chat. Yeah, wonderful. Thank Great. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bashar, yeah. uh, I see a couple of questions on the chat mm -hmm. that haven't been addressed yet. One about how Malik got out of Gaza, and one about traveling exhibits. Wonderful. Uh, Malik, would you like to uh, answer that question? Um, for sure, it was actually a funny story, but as I said before, it was a very difficult thing for me to go out simply because I'm a girl, I'm young, I'm single, and that was very difficult for my family when I told them that I want to travel, and they took me as a joke, like, are you serious? And you know how difficult it is. And then I insisted, then it was the last year of high school, which we call it Tawjihi. And it's very important that even no matter how, what age you are, people are still going to ask you how much you get in high school. Um, so she, they told me get the first in Gaza, in Palestine, on high school, like mark the top. And I told them, okay, I will do it. Then as I did a research on how many students they were going at the same year of me, they were 30,000 students. Then I had a, a lot of challenges. I worked very hard for an entire year um, to be the top. And finally, at the announcement day, I was able to get the second top and on Palestine and the first in Gaza Strip. So after the celebration and the ceremonies and um, graduation, uh, I told my family, okay, then I did what you wanted. So now it's for me to travel. And they said, we are sorry, we did not thought that you would get um, the, sec the first top in Palestine. So, <laughs> It was pretty difficult. It took me a year to convince them to travel. And every time they say yes, they talk with a friend and then they change their mind. Then I was able to get a part scholarship in Turkey, in Istanbul. Um, and I made it. It was a difficult time convincing my parents, more than even studying hard day in and day out. But um, I was able to do it. Um, when my fam when my father and my sister came to visit me, my sister wanted to stay with me, and so now I live with my sister. And my sister. Mm -hmm. wow. So this is how it happened. Thank you. Thank you um, for sharing. Yeah. Now, does uh, the MPP have? Uh, traveling exhibit plan to have traveling exhibits so we have we have had traveling exhibits in the past uh, yeah. uh, four or five years and we have done a lot of uh, locations throughout the US and actually I think that question comes from joy we uh, we were planning to be in uh, in Jacksonville for the Ramallah convention this summer uh, yes. for doing traveling exhibit and it was it was the convention was postponed yes so we hope that we will be there we're in touch with the Ramallah Federation and and uh, some of the people who were there to do that uh, to do the exhibit when whenever he, uh, he decide the next uh, federation is um, um, another question we had was how has COVID uh, affected our work and what can we do to to help so <laughs> yeah, the, yeah the, the, you know it's it's definitely have affected our work a lot as you see we can't open the museum we've lost uh, like our visitors now we have a uh, virtual visitors but we lost our visitors we lost our revenues and we have you know we have lost also a lot of a lot of donations and you know people coming to to our gift shop and tickets from from being at an event that we're doing at the museum so we are we are actually have appealed to uh, uh the u.s government there are grants that we applied for uh we haven't gotten these grants uh yet we're not sure if we're gonna get them it's it's really uh is uh a very nerve-wracking situation as as you know 
this continues. And uh, one of the things that we're doing, few of the things that we're doing and you can do to help is that this, this virtual museum is in response to, to the COVID-19 um, crisis. So we're, we're encouraging everyone to visit our virtual museum, to be on these calls every th Saturday at 1 p.m., invite your friends, invite your family. Uh, next week, we have another artist called Samar Husseini, which uh, maybe more can show her art in the museum, which you also going to, to, to talk about uh, her pieces and her artwork. Mm. Uh, you know, other, other ways you can, you can get involved is you can make a donation to the museum, make a gift to the museum, whether it's one time or a recurring donation, being part of the Resilience Monthly Club, which, uh, which gives you access to the museum and to our events, a free access to, it's like membership. Uh, and the other thing that we are recently just launched, we are doing uh, uh, kufiya masks. So we're, we have uh, designed masks from kufiyas and we have few of our volunteers who are working very hard on sewing these this masks as, as we speak. And we, the, the masks are online. You can order them uh, directly from, from, uh, from our website. And we will, we will mail it to you within, within uh, 10 days to two weeks. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, I would like to add, um, just keep the word, you know, spread the word about the museum, about the virtual tours. The more people we have, and, in our Zoom calls on Saturday, the more we can spread our message and uh, keep the museum alive. I've also posted a couple of links as well um, on how to, well, just a link to, to how to donate. And we do have a button to the uh, emergency fund too. So please consider uh, making a contribution if you can. I have a question for Malak. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm Katie, a friend of Bashara's and supporter of the museum. And um, I, I also just saw somebody else has the exact same question in the chat. So I'm just really curious to know, Malak, um, what you're studying and what are your plans for the future? And I also was wondering, um, you know, what, did, what are your goals kind of immediate and long term for your art? Mm -hmm. um, like what would you, not that every artist needs to have something they want to like accomplish with their art, but you know, what does it mean for you? Is it more personal about how you, how you process your own feelings or do you, do you have some kind of bigger um, goal for it or, or different goal for it? And also I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today um, and Ramadan Mubarak. And um, I really, really love your work from the first time I saw it shared by the museum. Um, and I noticed, I looked up your Instagram and saw that you have an Etsy store. And so I'm also wondering um, if there are currently other places where we can purchase your work. Um, so yeah, lots of questions, but <laughs> hope that's clear. Uh, thank you, Kate. Um, well, first of all, I study something that has little to do with art, uh, which is political science and international relations and economy. Uh, if you ask me if I like it, I don't. And <laughs> it's, <laughs> well, it's for me. It's I a very feel, positive thing. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I did not have fine arts in the university that offered me this scholarship. So I had to choose anything. They told me, would you like to study medicine or political science? And I thought I chose the easier, which is not completely true. Um, so what is my goal? Of course, I will not. For sure, I will not be staying in Turkey. It's for me. It's just like a temporary place till I finish my studying. Mm -hmm. I would very much love to study fine arts in Europe or in the U.S. It depends on which school offers me a scholarship um, and how people can purchase my artwork. So my Etsy shop is only for reproductions, like only like prints of my artwork. But in case if you are interested in original artwork, you can contact me uh, by email, Facebook, Instagram, and I send you the catalog. Um, so about the paintings and whether it's personal or not, well, 
anything that I do, as long as I am the one doing it, it becomes personal. And for me, as someone who started artwork, not because I was just having fun, it, it, I started it when it was a, a refuge and, and, and kind of sanctuary to escape from the overwhelming feelings of uh, being under war. Uh, of course, I shared my stories through my artwork. I shared uh, the life without electricity. I shared the life when you are caged. I shared uh, the feelings of being homesick. So it's a mixture of both personal feelings and also uh, being a Palestinian yeah. uh, and the, like, the problems and the struggles of uh, living here or anywhere for Palestinians. So yeah, I would say an artist always paints how they feel. And even though whatever they talk about in their art is so personal as long as it conveys their own feelings. I hope this answers uh, your question. Yeah, thank you. And just thanks again thanks so for being with us. Yeah. Thank you. And, and for, if you would like to uh, purchase uh, Malak's artwork, we have it on, on sale, uh, uh, for sale at the museum. So one, uh, uh, you, if, you, if you would like to do that, just contact us. We do have a couple more calls and excuse my cat, he's on a tear right now trying to get food. Um, but uh, the, the one is uh, for Malak, women are the most uh, common in, uh, subject in your work. How do you think your, the experience of women differ from men in, in Gaza? So since I was um, a, a young girl, I was always defensive for women even not knowing what equality meant. It was always started from the small unit of the society, which is my family. And I was always questioning mm -hmm. why my mom who's working a uh, person has to do the cooking most of the time and has to do the cleaning. Mm -hmm. So I was always questioning and the answer was, this is how it is. And this answer was not satisfying for me, unfortunately. <laughs> so I grew up always like defending, always asking for as long as I do this in my home, my brother has to do the same. So I always had this kind of conversation with myself, like whatever, even if I'm a girl, I have that complete ability to do what man can do. Um, I would say in my artwork, as I was starting to paint myself as a self-portrait, I always started to paint women. And then when I try to paint men, it always turns into women. Then I said, like, I'm just gonna paint what I know, which is a uh, woman. And for, for me, as a Palestinian woman, I had my own struggle. Um, I had my own stories and, and not because I'm Palestinian, but also because I'm a woman. And the struggle I had, like I sacrificed a year trying to convince my family to travel. And that explains it well. Um, so I'd say I, I always uh, feel strongly uh, defensive when it comes to women, especially in Palestine and more broadly in the Middle East. Um, unfortunately, women are not treated equally. And this is also Thank everywhere. You. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Cool. Thank so you so much. I was inspired by the quote that I saw that you had mentioned that women just trans men just transfer into women in your art. So I wanted to ask yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I'm a feminist. Wait, yes, I was, I was going to Who ask knows? you, but I knew the answer was yes. So yeah. it didn't need Everyone to be. Everyone should see if you believe in the equality between the two genders. Exactly. I mean, I, I, can, I can speak to it. To, you know, the, there's still such a huge gender gap, I feel, in Palestinian society. And it just, it is one of the many obstacles that we are, you know, encountering, you know. And, you know, I can definitely, I mean, I, I cannot, you know, it's, yeah. I'm a man, so I can't really speak to that part, yeah. you know, I, I can't pretend, but I do see it. I do see the inequality. I'm, you know, a small example, like my cousin, um, yeah. you know, she was young and she, you know, she's really smart, straight student, and she got a uh, acceptance to Boston College and her parents wouldn't let her, you know, my uncle was just, wouldn't let her go, you know, mm -hmm. but her, her brother, who was much, not the smart, he got a, he got admitted to the University of Alabama so he was allowed to go, but she had to stay in the Middle East. So there's still a lot of concern, you know, we're a very conservative society. So there's a lot of 
a lot of progress needs to happen, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, I think if I could jump in here, uh, thank you, Malik, for your point, because I think one thing that we're trying to do in this museum, specifically because we are calling it the Museum of the Palestinian People, is that we do not want it to be the conventional presentation museum. And to answer, like, to pick it back on what Muhammad was saying, um, I really like the quote of, uh, don't be the voice of the voiceless, just pass the mic. Yeah. So we, we really are about trying to be a hub where different Palestinians, men, women, old, young, refugees, rich, poor, uh, get to express their Palestinianhood and their experience of being Palestinian their own way. Uh, and not us, you know, the, the elites or the board of the museum that decide what is or is not Palestinian, what is or is not yeah. Palestine. Uh, so thank you, Malik, for what you said. And it's, it, uh, um, what we would ask all of you guys, I'm, I'm very happy that we have around 40 people, I think, on this call, which is, I think, more than we can actually physically fit in the space, um, is to carry our message uh, around. We really want this to be a space where we use the Palestinian story to have the larger conversation of what makes us all uh, human beings. Uh, so we want this to be a platform for the larger conversation and how, especially in this, uh, you know, the, the challenge that COVID is presenting to us uh, of what happens when we forget about others and think only about ourselves, how, like, never have we been in a situation where literally our own health and well-being is so dependent on others working in, in solidarity with each other. Yes. And that, I think, is kind of pro propitious that, uh, or like divine intervention that we're finding ourselves in this situation where our message as Palestinians is uh, 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 no, no one is free until all of us are free, none of us are safe until all of us are safe. So it is a message of solidarity and hope, and we hope that this small space um, is really this intimate space where we can have this conversation and scale it, you know, across the, uh, the United States, but across the globe as well. So thank you everyone for joining and thank you for being our ambassadors for this message. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is so there much. any last questions that we can, we can answer in the next minute or two before we, we, before we close the, the call? Yeah, um, this is Andrea Barron. Malik, I wanted to know if your mom, your family, especially your mom and your sisters, what do they think about all your great artwork and how you portray women? Uh, they are very proud. I grew up in a family that really loved artwork, uh, especially my uncle. He's a very established Palestinian artist. Um, mm. He used to be a lecturer in an art college in Gaza, and he has, of course, a big influence on my artwork and a guidance as well. Uh, they are very proud. I started uh, my art journey when I was 14. And at that time where I was painting more than studying, my family started getting worried. Mm -hmm. um, and they were like, just do painting when in holiday. Uh, so, uh, but when they saw me and they saw the influence that I made and the friendship that I created and the exhibitions that I did, they were like kind of more uh, convinced and they were more supportive. And I started my art career when I was 14. I was able to make a living through my artwork when I was pretty young. And that made it more, like higher credibility for me as an artist. So of course they are proud and they encourage me to go on in my artwork. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, wonderful. I think we're, if there is any any last any last uh, comment or questions, if if there is not, uh, I uh, someone said that she's moved by uh, seeing her mother-in-law uh, featured in this tour. Thank you. Yes, yes, we we have been uh, working with the Sah family on getting these these passports. So thank you. Um, so again, thank you so much for, for being on this Zoom call. Uh, thank you, Malak, for, thank you so much. for joining yeah, thank us. You. It's really great to hear yeah. from you, and it's really great for, for others to, to join from you. And uh, hopefully, 
once this is gone, we can have you at the museum. Uh, you can you can visit the museum in person, and we can have have you give a talk and and answer and questions uh, for people in in person. Again, thank you for yeah for being here. Thanks for everyone, and uh, stay tuned for next Saturday. We will have another call with uh, Samar Husseini at uh, 1 p.m. And we would have a call like that virtual tour every Saturday at one. And if you would like to have more, to ask more questions of Malak or me, or if you would like to buy prints of Malak artwork or her painting, just contact us and we will, we will direct you. Uh, thank you again. Thank you for being our ambassadors and for being part of this museum. And I hope you're having, I hope you will have a great weekend and great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank everyone. you. Thank you. Ramadan Thank you. 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 Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.